this week's sun six one. Lead me to the rock, to the prayer master with the straight instruments of David. Hear my cry, O oh God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O oh God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day.
say thank you. Thank you because of your love, because of your glory, and because of your light. May your name be forever praised in that world. And it is in Jesus' name. Let's worship you, Lord. We magnify your name.
It's a spiritual gift. And yet being a spiritual gift, continuing Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, For it is by grace you've been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Here a definition of faith is provided. This is not intended to be an exhaustive definition, as we we'll see later in verse 6, which contains an elaboration of the essence of biblical faith. The writer is showing what it means to believe in the promises of God. What does it mean to only believe in what God has promised us? Because He is faithful, He is holy, and His faithfulness endures forever. is being sure of what we hope for. And when we talk about faith, you must be sure of what you are, you are placing your faith unto. And we don't want to say faith is a verb because the belief then is the doer. So remember the pronoun, the nouns and the verbs. To believe. So faith is being sure of what we hope for. As on other occasions in the book, faith is connected to hope. When most people talk about their hopes, the element of confidence is entirely absent. They have certain longings and aspirations, but the future is random and unpredictable. The outcome is by no means guaranteed. Biblical hope is the certainty or the certainty that God will keep his word, including as yet unfulfilled promises. The use of the word sure, because you see, faith is being sure of what we hope for. So, faith must come, you know, to bring the surety that what you have hoped for is already yours. So, sure is a guarantee, like a document pro proving the ownership of a property. You are sure that this is yours because you have that document. You are sure. What the writer is explaining is that if a person has faith, then that in itself is proof that the person has possession of eternal life and all its blessings. These blessings are mainly focused on the promises of God about the future in the returns in glory. While faith and hope are two different elements, there is an indivisible link between the two. So he says now faith is being sure of what we are for and certain of what we do not see. So there must be certainty. The author goes on to describe faith as placing our trust in things we cannot see, but which are still real. Faith enables the Christian believer to be sure about spiritual realities to which the unbeliever is blind. It is not a fair hopelessness, but a God-given certainty about things that are impossible to prove. Faith is not a gamble, but it is based on knowledge. It is based on knowledge. And so that's why verse 2 now he says, this is what the ancients were commended for. They were commended for their faith because they had total belief in what they believed this verse forms the connection between biblical faith and the spiritual forefathers whose lives were shaped by faith in the promises of God. And I know as a child of God, God has promised you a lot. This kind of faith made godly men and women in the past the great examples they are. They present in the faith confirmed by the fact 
that they received it from God a favorable report. They were not more clever or better than us, but they exercised the gift of faith and are therefore role or role models for all Christian believers. And our three begins to exemplify them. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. As we quoted some other time in Corinthians, we saw that what we see today is a proceed of what, what, of what wasn't seen. For out of the invisible, the visible is. Faith must have an object. It is nonsense to say, I have faith unless that faith reaches out to something or someone. You can't say, oh, I have faith. They will ask you of a what? So faith must have an object. Spiritual faith is trusting in God, not a man-named idol or a product of human thinking or speculation. Faith is in God who has made himself known in the Bible and is the one who made the world. Therefore understand that none of us were present when the world began, so we cannot prove anything about what has happened. Spiritual faith bridges the gap with the certainty that the original or the origin of creation is God himself. So, God himself is the origin of creation. Without him, we don't have anything we can say it is. Before he spoke, there was nothing apart from him. That's why Psalm, that 3, verse 6 to 9 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made their starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea to yours. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it is to defer. God gave assistance to everything. Everything. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were born, or oh, you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He brought it into being. So, verses 4 to 7, faith is and is exemplified by what we see as the preferred believers. He says in verse 4, and when we talk about preferred, that is the believers before the flood. So from verse 8 we begin the believers after the flood. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. The first example of faith in action is Abel. And speaks of a humble lands of the mercy of God. <coughs> Not like his father who sinned and fell short of God's glory. The record of his life is found in Genesis 4, verses 2 to 8. Abel and his brother, who is the elder brother Cain, were the children of Adam and Eve. According to what they had been taught, both brought sacrifices to worship God. Abel was a shepherd and brought the best of the firstborn lambs of his flock to God. Cain, who was a farmer, presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. As the two brothers worshipped, God demonstrated in some tangible manner that he accepted Abel and his worship, but rejected Cain and his worship. Various suggestions have been made as to why God accepted Abel and his offering and rejected Cain and his offering. And remember, they are the first now in the generation 
And so the two sets an example of uh, what continuously happens even today. If you come now to the, to, to the Israelites, the Israelites were given orders on the kind of sacrifices they had to, to, to give. Not to give any lame or any animal which is in defect. And so just like Cain was rejected then, and Abel's was rejected then, this is a continual thing. There are also those who sacrifice today and God does not accept their sacrifices. And they will never know because they put in a, in a cup. But at the end of the day, they fail to get the results of Mutu Abel's and Akake And so, Cain and his worship was rejected. Various suggestions, therefore, as I've noted, have been made as to why God accepted Abel and his offering and rejected Cain and his offering. The author of the book of Hebrews, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, makes it abundantly clear that faith was the difference. Faith was the difference. Not necessarily the issue of Willis Kali as he says, by faith he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his sufferings. Abel was a believer and Cain was not. It wasn't the nature of their respective offerings which made the difference. There is no detailed information in the early chapters of Genesis as to how God was to be worshipped other than through faith. There is no other exemplified way. Cain's problem was in one that was one of the attitudes. That is why in verse 7, if you want now to notice that it was not the kind of the sacrifice he had given, but lack of faith, he says, if you do good, will you not be accepted? But if you do, you don't see this crouching at your door and, uh, you know, it yearns uh, to have you. He says, uh, let me read from uh, around verse 4, so that I can connect to you But Elder brought fat portions from some of the festival of his flock. Remember, festival and fat, the two words used. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then, then the Lord said to him, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, she is crouching at your door to desire to have you, but you must master it, but you must master it. God rejected Cain and his offering because of the condition of Cain's heart. He was angry. How can he be angry of Abel? And it isn't Abel who was accepting the sacrifice. Abel being a believer was accepted by God and the tokens of his worship were perceived. The word. So the tokens were received. The word offering understand, is a general term which means present. How God accepted the sacrifice of Abel is not indicated in Genesis, but it was by this means that he was commended as a righteous man. God spoke well of the gifts of Abel brought. Abel's worship flowed from a heart filled with faith, and because of faith he was reckoned as righteous. Righteousness is received from God through faith alone. Genesis 15 verse 6. And it is through faith that the righteous life, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38, Romans 1 17, Galatians 3 11. It is through faith that the righteous live. And so, and by faith he still speaks even though he is dead. And you see, in chapter 12, verse 24, when we turn to chapter 12, we will see how even his blood speaks but heal against his brother. Therefore, a final word is given about the example of Abel. Though he is dead, yet he still speaks. Abel, through the example of his faith and righteousness, still speaks to us today. This is especially relevant as far as the original readers of the letter are concerned. Abel worshipped God acceptably through faith. 
God cannot be approached without faith. No matter how correct the outward forms, form that the individual are. Though Enoch was viciously murdered by his jealous and angry brother, he still lives in the presence of God because he was a believer. Verse 5, he opens with, by faith Enoch, by faith Enoch, was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. The second illustration provided by the author is Enoch. Once again, very little is written about this man in Genesis 5, 18 to 24. But we are only told that he walked with God and he was normal. The only other information contained in the scriptures about Enoch is that he prophesied of the sure coming judgment of God against the ungodly. And we see Jude verses 14 to 15 quoting him. But then there are the three letters of Enoch, which are the Deuterocanonicus. We have first letter of Enoch, the second and the third. Which we are not presumably sure whether he is the one who wrote them. But they speak a lot and they are full of mysteries. So he was taken from this life. The other's initial reference to this believer was that he did not die a physical death. Enoch was a believer who, because of his faith in God, walked with God. This means that he lived in harmony with God's revealed will and sought to please God. From Jude, we know that he spoke clearly of coming judgment, suggesting he was a preacher of the word of God, calling sinners to faith and repentance and the warning of the certain consequences of unbelief and disobedience. And you see, Jude was quoting, uh, you know, Enoch chapter 1. So he could not be found because God had taken him away. Enoch's life on earth was not terminated in the usual manner of death, for he was not found because God had taken him away. He was suddenly and supernaturally removed from this earthly existence. Whether the translation of Enoch was witnessed by anyone is not recorded that one can presume that people looked for Enoch and did not find him. This was a demonstration of the power of God over death and of the certainty or certainty of the hope of deliverance from condemnation and judgment through faith. Elijah was a second example of one being taken and not experiencing death, not in 2 Kings 2 11. A search was made for Elijah in 2 Kings 2 verse 15 to 18, they searched for him. The fact that no one could find this man only ever said that God had translated, translated them. But remember, Elijah was taken before the very presence of Elijah. So he saw the chariots which, you know, carried him away. Why? Because the robe which Elijah was wearing, he gave it to Elisha. Not face to face, but when he was up there, it's when he released it. A similar translation will be experienced by all believers who are still living at the time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this world in power and glory. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 52. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 15 to 17. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God, as was the case with Abel. So Enoch received a commendation from God. The evidence of Enoch's faith was his walk with God. This was proof of the reality of God and his promises. Faith is much more than observing near right religious forms. It is a life of communion, communion with God. God was pleased to use Enoch as an example for all believers to show the certainty of the glorious hope of the resurrection, what will happen, and of deliverance from eternal death. His life and godliness remain as a pattern to be followed by believers at all times. And without faith, verses, it is impossible to please God. The particular case of Enoch prompts the right to apply the important truth that it is impossible to please God without faith. This applies to all who claim to acknowledge God. The writer in this applies, the writer in this stressing the importance of faith is providing instruction regarding the nature of biblical faith. God has determined that the highest creature is to relate to him through faith, leading trust and humble 
growing of the tables. This is what was required of Adam and Eve in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. God, through his word, was to be trusted and obeyed. Adam and his disobedience constituted rebellion against God and believed that the rejection of the truth of his word. In this way, they removed themselves from God and acted as if he did not exist. They even hid themselves and clothed themselves, if you know, with the leaves of the fig trees. To be without God is to be without hope. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12. Suffocated by darkness and ignorance and blindly gripped by sin. As noted in Romans chapter 1 verses 22 to 25 and Ephesians chapter 4 verses 18 and 19. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. So if you want to go to God, and anyone who goes to God must firstly, and it is the one who must, believe that God exists. The obvious first requirement in relating to God through faith is to believe that He is. And this implies that God is personal and distinct from creation. From the creation. That He is transcendent and yet approachable. Faith must have an object and God is the supreme and eternal object for all true faith. A relationship with God cannot be hard. A relationship with God cannot be hard without faith. You can never have it without faith and it cannot be approached through outward from someone. So, and that he wants those who honestly seek him. If you seek God, he wants. In coming to God, it is required to believe that He rewards those who diligently seek Him. In the context of the letter, the idea of approaching God is to be understood in the sense of coming to the God of grace who provides salvation for undeserving sins through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The believer comes to God with confidence when coming by faith alone in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So He becomes now our medium to approach God. The Lord Jesus Christ as the High Priest has made effective atonement for our sins to enable the believer to approach God with boldness and confident expectation of obtaining mercy and grace. Such coming to God is not to be thought of as only occurring in public services, but on a daily basis resulting from walking with God. This was true in the life of Enoch. Believers, are to diligently seek God through prayer and the study of His Word, consciously endeavoring to do the will of God in all spheres of life. This requires application and discipline with a thankful and humble spirit for all of God's mercies. As we read in Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, God will reward all who seek Him in this manner. The reward is God Himself and knowing Him more intimately, as we are told in Genesis 15, verse 1. God will reward all who seek Him in this manner, all of them. The reward is God Himself. If we believe in the grace of God alone, we deny any merit to faith. And, and then expectation of rewards on the grounds of our own efforts. Whatever may be praiseworthy in the life of an individual is the fruit of God's grace. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 29 to 21. <coughs> and so the last verse, which begins by faith Noah, and then there is a comma there. Let me talk of by faith Noah. This is the third illustration of faith. In verse 1, it began by faith. In this verse, in verse 5, he also began with by faith Enoch. And now verse 7, he begins by faith Noah. The then illustration of faith in the period prior to the flood is that of Noah. The life of Noah is recorded in Genesis 5.28 to Genesis 9.29. And then Noah is introduced to us as one who found grace in the eyes of the world. Genesis chapter 6 verse 8. He is described as being blameless, a man who walked with God in Genesis 6.9. And Noah was also a preacher of righteousness, as we are told by Peter in his second letter, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Who during this, the period of God's grace and long suffering and his own construction of the ark called the world to repentance? 
First Peter chapter 3, verse 6, 19 to 20. And remember, it was a span of 120 years that the, 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 the period is spent in building there. So by faith, Noah, when he warned about things not yet seen, in the Holy Fear built an ark to save his family. No one demonstrated this faith in God when he prepared the an, an ark after being divinely warned of things not yet seen. We are not uh, told anywhere that God would come to Noah face to face as we are told of Moses. So the way and the manner he appeared to him, Noah believed. The great and universal flood of God's judgment against sin was true and seen, but this was a reality to Noah who believed it would take place as revealed by God. Genesis 6 30. God instructed Noah to build the ark according to present plans and dimensions. This Noah followed Genesis 6 verse 14 to 16 and verse chapter 7 verse 5. Out of God's faith flowed, flowed godly fear. Genuine fear, I mean genuine faith, therefore produces respect and reverence for God and His Word. Noah's faith and obedience resulted in the saving of his family, his wife, three sons, and their wives. Genesis 7 13, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, and 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. The appointed means of judgment, the universal land, was also the instrument of salvation. Noah and his family were saved through water. The waters bore the ark above the destruction below. Because as the water was raising them up, the destruction was happening now in under those who are immersed and covered by the water. By his faith, he condemned the world. Through his obedience to God, Noah visibly and dramatically condemned the world. Life went on and changed, and people were unmoved by the preaching of coming judgment and the construction of the ark. As we are told in Matthew chapter 24, verse 38, Luke chapter 17, verse 26 and 27. People were defiantly disobedient to the call to repentance and callously indif indifferent. To the long suffering and patience of God. First Peter chapter 3, verse 19 to 20. And I can say, if there is any pastor who pretend nobody was moved, it's only no. He spent 120 years preaching to men. And out of all he preached to, no one, no one listened to his message. Remember there was a reason. And became here of the righteousness that comes by faith. Through faith, no one received the righteousness of God. Not until the New Testament is the glorious truth, fully spelled out that believers receive the righteousness of God. This means that believers are being acceptable to God by the righteousness of Christ. This comes through faith alone in Christ. As we are taught in Romans 3, verses 21 to 22, and Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Noah and all the Old Testament believers were heirs of that blessing. Therefore, understand that what matters to God is a genuine trust and belief in Him as the Creator of God. Faith. And an obedient submission to Him that is working with God. Man is a fallen creature. Being in open rebellion against God and consequently deserves God's judgment, therefore. The Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, came to earth to rescue people from this, this situation. He gave his own perfect life as a sacrifice and atoned for the sins of the people he came to save. The only way a person can be accepted by God is if they match God's protective perfection. To come to God on the basis of our own merit and obedience will utterly fail because we are sinners. Breaking God's laws every day of our lives. We cannot improve ourselves by keeping to religious ritual and ceremony. The only way available is to trust in God's will, 
which is to believe in his son and his death on the cross. And this involves a humbling submission to Christ's authority for every part of the person's life. When a person trusts in Christ, Christ's perfectness is imputed to the believer, recorded to him. God looks upon that person and sees the perfection of his son. This is what the writer of Hebrews is demonstrating through the lives of Old Testament believers. Abel, Enoch, and Noah show through their lives how they trusted in God by faith and not in any other ways. God looks upon them as being righteous men. This is the great lesson for the Hebrew Christians reading this book. It is not by observing religious laws and practices which they were learning to go back and start following the Judaic system of worship. It is by faith and all in Christ alone. In Christ alone. And so it is in back of their minds, having told them from chapter 4 to chapter 8 about the old system of worship, still telling them, I'm telling you there is no option for faith in that. You only observe, but you don't have any faith in anyone because you are only observing the law. So you need to understand the biblical faith and its object. For people believe in all sorts of things. They can be taken in by hearing what others say, or it may be the customs that have been passed down to them. People may believe in things that they want to have they want to happen such as a cure for an illness. It may be that people believe in a particular philosophy or a politician who will get things done. Patients often believe in the diagnosis the doctor makes of their condition. The writer to the Hebrews has carefully demonstrated the importance of relating to God through faith alone and of patiently preserve and persevering throughout life. The faith that is believed must be concentrated only in the Lord Jesus Christ and his one for all sacrifice for sin. What is this faith? How does it work? Is it the same sort of thing that people show in doctors of political philosophies? Biblical faith is presented to us therefore today in the opening verses of chapter 11 of Hebrews as a dynamic principle and power in the life of the believer. And you see the faith getting defined. Define and define it into a sense. Faith is the substance, the assurance or title deed of the Christian hope. What is hoped for is what God has promised. What God has promised is an eternal inheritance. This is still unseen because we have not seen that eternal inheritance. So we hope for it. But this, which is not seen, is very real to the man of faith. There are those who don't believe that there is life after this. Faith then is the evidence or conviction of all things which God has promised. Through faith we hope in what we cannot yet see. It is because of faith that we hope the hope of the eternal inheritance will never be extinguished by the difficulties of life. Faith is fundamental to our knowledge of God. Through faith we receive all true knowledge of God. True knowledge of God is rooted in His being the source and sustainer of all life in the universe. All things are created by God from what cannot, from what cannot be seen. That is from the power of energy of God. All things are created through the dynamic power of God's spoken word. All people are accountable to God, therefore, because He is the sovereign creator of God. God says, see us through His word and will change the world through His word. Faith brings about an understanding and acceptance of these things. Faith is the means through which man is to relate to God. The elders of our fathers received a good testimony from God because of faith. Faith is the means that God has appointed through which we are to relate to Him. We are to believe that God is personal, true, living and distant from the creation. 
but approach it all. God wants us to seek Him diligently. He will reward all who do seek Him diligently with a greater sense of His personal presence. God can only be known through faith. And that faith is to be rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. As God's sons are the Savior of men, God is to be sought diligently through prayer. Therefore, this study of His word and the humble obedience and how you study continuously is one of the key. But then you need to understand what does faith mean. I will give you five kinds of faith. The word faith is used to the number of different meanings. So I give you five and then you can. Number one, optimum or hopefulness. People say I have faith. Or if I did not have faith, I would give up. Most often, this has no reference to God, but is a simple hopefulness without good reason that the problem will be solved satisfactorily. Number two, we have natural trustfulness. We all exercise this kind of faith when, for example, we believe the aeroplane we fly on will reach its destination safely. Or the car, or the bus, or that the chair we want to sit on will not let us down. So you have faith on that seat you are seated on. Otherwise, if you are worried, it can, you know, seek you down or it can dismantle, get dismantled, you won't sit with full force. You've released all your force to that seat, is it? This is not often called faith, but it is sometimes used to explain saving faith. This is unwise because in each case, the faith may prove to be misplaced because of human unreliability. Number three, we have doctrinal ascent. James chapter 2, verses 23 to 24. It is, a post, it is possible to give assent to all the doctrines of the scripture. That God exists and oversees all human life, and yet not to trust personally in Jesus Christ for salvation from sin and its consequences. Number four, discipleship. John chapter 2, verses 23 to 24. This is admiration and admiration for Jesus Christ. His teaching and his miracles. There may even be a desire to seek to live according to his teaching. But in itself, it will all falls short of trust in God in Christ as the only Savior. And lastly, we have the spiritual faith. As we are told in Ephesians 2, which we read, and Hebrews 11, 6, which we also, also read. This is the gift of God as it is a, fa a, a faculty of the new life he gives us when we are born again. It enables us to renounce all our own efforts to earn our salvation and to trust in Christ alone to put us right with God. Faith in Christ gives us access to God, and this is called saving faith. By this faith, we are enabled to live the Christian life, to serve the Lord and work for Him. Faith is an active principle that carries the whole man with it, and in it, hand will and affections, body, soul, and spirit. There is no act so absurd in its reach and so total in its, you know, momentum as the, as, as the act of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father Jesus, I thank you because of this very time. Lord, I thank you because of this your children. Lord, I thank you because of the grace and the blessings of having this day. Lord, I thank you and I applaud to your glory. Thank you, Lord, because you are good. Thank you, Lord, because you are God. And how I pray that, Lord, you shine and open the floodgates of heaven, Lord, and minister to these children, both physically and spiritually. Lord, I speak to their health. I speak to their spiritual life. I speak to their physiological stature. I speak, Lord, against every kind of attacks and every schemes of the devil. Lord, I pray that you be magnified and as I plead with you for continued support upon them. That our Father, you enable them to be what you created them to become. The purpose you created them to carry on to serve, that Lord you grace them to. How I pray against every force of the enemy and every scheme of the devil and any plan and mission which is not, you know, initiated by you for your glory. 
Lord, I surrender them to you, O Lord. Lord, I surrender their families to you, their brothers, their sisters, their siblings, their parents, their, their spouses. Lord, I surrender them to thee, O God. How I pray that, Abba Father, you do away with every hardship and every seed which is germinating in them or which has already germinated or, or which is to, which is not from you, Lord. May you uproot. May you destroy the process of that evil seed. May you destroy the seed totally because Lord, you come. It is you who are pleased to you told you tell us in Ezekiel 17 about that tree which failed to hold up and instead diverted the branches and the roots to that plain eagle, which wasn't the eagle that sourced it from the pink in Lebanon. I surrender these your children to me. I pray for the time they also waited for me to come. That my Father, you release a special blessing to them. Lord, I thank you for this blessing. Lord, I thank you for the gift of rain. Lord, I thank you because we've prayed that you've answered our prayers. And Lord, I continue to plead with you and hunt you for more. That my Father, this rain will continue. Not only this month, but also in January. All the way to next January because God will come. May this nation experience this gift of your bounty every day of our lives. May you change our seasons, O God. Where may there all be dry, dryness or drought. But every, every part of this nation, every town, every village, we will receive your word, your blessings, O Lord. Not because of their, their other lives, but because of your courage. Because Lord, you are God who loves us all, regardless of our statuses. I thank you, Lord, because of your children. Answer their prayers. Every petition in them, every petition that they have, Lord, I pray that you answer. Open your heavenly power to give it up to them. I need this blessing to you. And now I pray that in the spirit of our own, spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and of right, spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord be upon you. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace forever in Jesus' name. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.